Solo Leveling by Chu Gong Chapter 50 His Resolve Chairman Yu laid all his cards on the table. The truth is, I have the same illness that your mother suffered from. Jin Wu was completely caught off guard. Does Jin Ho know? Myung Han shook his head. Other than my doctor, only three people know. My wife, my secretary, and me. And I'm the fourth. That's right. Jin Wu nodded as he finally understood why Chairman Yu had approached him directly in secret instead of going through Jin Ho. He wanted to hide his illness from his family. I mean, tens of thousands of employees rely on him. The stock of a company fluctuated depending on the well-being of its chairman, and even a single cough could trigger a drastic change. If it ever got out that Chairman Yu's days were numbered, Eugene Construction and its subsidiaries would be in trouble. For this reason, Myung Han was keeping his illness under wraps even from his own family. His way of accepting this reality was to bear the weight of the world solely on his shoulders. Even so, he shared it with me. It was probably a calculated risk. Myung Han was a businessman, and not just any businessman, but a stellar one who didn't know the meaning of the word failure. There was no way an executive of his caliber would risk anything without a reward. Jin Wu had a rough idea of what Myung Han wanted to ask of him, and sure enough, the chairman resolutely continued. I've searched the world over for a cure, but I've only discovered one patient who has been free from this illness. Yes, just as Jin Wu had thought. I don't believe it's a coincidence that the only person ever cured of the eternal sleep disease is your mother, Hunter Sung. Jin Wu had astonished many with mysterious, never before seen abilities. Chairman Yu had thoroughly done his research and come to a reasonable conclusion. Jin Wu might have cured his mother with one of those abilities. He did not acknowledge whether the chairman was right. Instead, he observed him in silence. Chairman Yu swallowed hard. I can't afford any missteps here. If everything up to this point had been a warm-up, it was now time for the actual match. It was the moment of truth. Myung Han exhaled briefly and spoke with conviction. I swear that everything I'm telling you now is the truth. He pushed the check forward a little more. This token of my appreciation is not all that I'm willing to offer you. The blank check was only a part of the payment, as Myung Han could give Jin Wu more than just money. If you help me, I will forever be in your debt. The tiger of the financial jungle was bowing his head and pleading for Jin Wu's help. Those who knew Chairman Yu would have been flabbergasted at the sight. On the other hand, Jin Wu maintained his calm as he studied the whole man. I don't think he's lying. The Chairman's racing heart, heavy breathing, and desperation hidden beneath a facade of calm told Jin Wu everything he needed to know. Chairman Yu was telling the truth. However, earnestly wishing for something didn't guarantee that it would come true. Jin Wu deliberated for a bit before making his choice. I'm sorry. Those two short words devastated Myung Han. I can't help you with this matter. But then... His hopes had been so high going into this discussion that Myung Han was having trouble accepting Jin Wu's rejection. How was your mother cured, Hunter Sung? Sir! Jin Wu's expression turned rather serious. A sudden chill in the air reminded Myung Han exactly who he was dealing with. Jin Wu continued, If I knew how to cure the sleeping disease and wanted to profit from it, then I would have already done so. A handful of possible scenarios ran through Chairman Yu's mind. Did Jin Wu fear being targeted by someone powerful? No, not possible. Myung Han immediately dismissed that one. Jin Wu was an active S-rank hunter, and an especially powerful one at that. The notion that someone would threaten him was ridiculous. Then, did Jin Wu want something other than money? Chairman Yu rejected that idea as well. Hunter Sung could achieve fame and popularity if he so desired, but he didn't. 
Oh, Chairman, you belatedly realized his mistake. The key to negotiating was finding out what one's counterpart desired. Give them what they wanted to get what you wanted, was the basis of negotiating. However, Chairman, you had no idea what Jean Wu desired, so it was doomed to fail. It's one of two cases. Either Jean Wu really didn't know the cure, or he didn't really want anything. Either way, the situation remained desperate for Myung Han. I see. Chairman, you didn't try to keep Jean Wu any longer. Well then, Myung Han awkwardly rose when Jean Wu did and called for his secretary, who hurried into the room. Sir, as soon as Kim set foot inside, he felt the tension between Jean Wu and Chairman Yu. His face turned grim, as this meeting had been their last hope. Sir, you called? Myung Han nodded weakly. Hunter's son is leaving, so please escort him home. Oh, no, thank you. Jean Wu politely declined the ride and got in the elevator alone after a short bow to Chairman Yu and his secretary, W. Min. The elevator moved rapidly from the highest floor to the lowest. Jean Wu hadn't realized it before, but the elevator was way too big and empty for just one person. He let out a large sigh. Ha! Huh? Jean Wu felt uncomfortable about rejecting Chairman Yu, as he was the father of someone he considered a brother. Jean Wu could have let his compassion get the best of him and help the old man, but I don't know him personally. Jean Wu had no idea what kind of person Chairman Yu was, or whether he really had the illness or was harboring another motive. The elixir of life Jean Wu had used to cure his mother was potent but in limited supply, so he had to be selective using it. The chairman's offer had been unconventional, but hadn't been enough to persuade him. Ding! The elevator doors opened on the first floor, and Jean Wu got off with his hood back up. Unlike earlier, when he'd been accompanied by Myung Han, nobody seemed to recognize him. He did get some curious glances from people wondering why he had used the executive elevator, but Jean Wu paid them no heed and headed for the exit. The security guard spotted his approach and held the door open for him, but Jean Wu stopped in his tracks as he heard a voice across the lobby. This is the latest news regarding Japan. Jean Wu turned toward the sound. The giant TV monitor in the lobby had been turned off on his arrival but was currently on and broadcasting a live feed from Japan about the dungeon break and the quickly spreading disaster left in its wake. Jean Wu walked up to the monitor. The footage of the city captured by the news helicopter was horrifying. Giants were destroying buildings and snatching up humans to swallow them whole. What remained of the army deployed weapons against the giants in vain. It was impossible to defeat magic beasts without the power of hunters. While not exact, the death toll was estimated at well over a million. It was the very definition of a tragedy. Jean Wu was stunned. This was the first time he'd seen any footage from Japan because after he'd left Jinchil to wrap up things at the Double Dungeon, he'd gone straight home and passed out. The situation in Japan was much worse than he expected and it reminded him of the nightmare that had occurred at Jeju Island four years ago. The one good thing about that incident had been it had happened on an island, preventing the problem from spreading throughout mainland Korea. But it was a different story for Japan. The country itself was on the verge of total annihilation. Ba dump, be a dump, be a dump. Jin was heart quickened, and he was starting to feel irritated. The thought of such weaklings devouring humans like that disgusted him. Wait a sec. Ji Wu jolted in surprise. Did he just think of them as weaklings? He had never fought these giants before, nor could he detect their magic energy from the TV. So what made him so naturally deem the giants his inferiors? Was he being overconfident? Ji Wu tilted his head this way and that before shaking it. There's so much going on that I can't think straight. Jin Wu turned 
slipped past the worried employees crowding around to watch the broadcast and hastily exited the building. It was day two of the dungeon break, and the whole world's eyes were on Japan. What was their plan? Was there any hope left for Japan? Would the United States intervene? Would the giants cross the ocean and invade other countries once they were done there? Concern grew as Japan continued to collapse. Even its worst detractors expressed sympathy for them, no matter how superficial their words. However, the country did not need pity. They needed concrete action and the power to deal with the magic beasts. As the United States continued to delay making an official statement, news broke that a tenth of Japan had already been destroyed. Videos of evacuees flooding the highways aired on TV. People had left their homes to escape to the outskirts of the nation, but they would eventually hit the literal end of the road, where they would have to come to grips with their own ends. More and more questions were raised as the world bore witness to the unfolding horror. What the hell is Korea doing? Why isn't Korea helping Japan? Doesn't Korea know what compassion is? The Jeju Island raid had only been a few weeks earlier. Japan had lost half of their S-rank hunters because of it. So why hadn't Korea returned the aid? As the number of fatalities increased by the hour, so did the people's grief and anger. As the sympathizers with Japan increased, so did the criticism toward Korea. Make your move, Korea. Does loyalty mean nothing to them? Did Korea forget Jeju Island? It was a hot topic globally. To add fuel to the fire, people began growing suspicious of Japan's seeming willingness to ask everyone but Korea for help. Then, on day three, President Goh finally decided it was time to call a press conference. He looked to the reporters and cameras that filled the room and quietly spoke. First, I would like to extend my condolences to the people of Japan during these trying times. Now, allow me to state the position of the Hunters Association of Korea. Prior to Korea's press conference, the Hunter Command Center also announced their decision. In the press room at the Hunter Command Center, the United States addressed the issue of the dungeon break for the first time. Hunters are assembling as we speak. Was the United States finally moving to help Japan? The throng of reporters in attendance cheered as if they were the ones being rescued, as none of them wished for the countless deaths that would otherwise occur. But as the atmosphere in the room heated up, the spokesperson shook their head. However, this is not in relation to Japan. What? The reporters murmured among themselves and exchanged looks. No one had been briefed in advance, so they looked to one another for clarification. The spokesperson gestured to the screen behind them. Whoa! No! The reporter's jaw dropped at what was being shown on the screen. A hush fell over the room, though an occasional moan could be heard here and there. The footage being presented was shocking. This gate was discovered today in the state of Maryland. Although smaller than the one in Japan, the gate was still abnormally large. And while there was no direct correlation between the size of a gate and its rank, a huge gate never led to a low-rank dungeon. The spokesperson explained, According to the evaluation done by our investigative team, this gate is an S-rank just like the one in Japan. Our top hunters will do their best to clear this dungeon. Reporters expressed their despair by covering their faces with their hands, shaking their heads, or groaning loudly. It was unprecedented for two S-rank gates to appear around the same time. Of course, the United States had nothing to worry about because they had several dozen S-rank hunters scouted from all over the world to take care of it. But this spelled bad news for Japan. The U.S. has no firepower to spare for Japan. When the news broke that the help they'd been desperately waiting for was not coming, the Japanese people plummeted into anguish. It was the end. The giant magic beasts destroyed everything in sight, 
as they advanced to the south, and the people who escaped north were running out of places to flee. This was the current state of things when Korea held its press conference. President Go announced, Korea will not be getting involved with the matters in Japan. The day before the press conference, two people, Jin Wu and Jin Ho, were the only ones present in the huge office of the Ajin Guild. Jin Ho's eyes twinkled with excitement. Boss, there's a beer at gate. Should I book it? Is that gate on the Hunter's Guild's turf? Hmm? Oh yes it is, boss. No, I'll pass. Oh, got it. The Hunter's Guild had enough on their plates after having lost many of their elite members. Taking advantage of the situation and booking the gate wouldn't be a good look. Jin Ho turned to Jin Wu. Boss, what have you been looking at so intensely? Jin Wu took his eyes from the monitor and leaned back in his chair. Hey, Jin Ho. Yes, boss? Should I go to Japan? Excuse me? Jin Ho was caught off guard. He knew who he was talking to. He'd had a front row seat to Jin was fighting more times than anyone else. However, S rank gates were another story. They were impossible to measure, so anything could happen. Just as, there was a huge range in power among S rank hunters. No one could predict how dangerous the magic beasts emerging from an S rank gate could be. That was why Jin Ho couldn't bring himself to brush off his boss's words. Jin Ho glanced at Jin Wu's monitor. Ah, it was filled with breaking news about the dungeon break. So the situation had been troubling him. Ji Wu possessed great power, and with it came great stress. Hang on, boss. Hmm? The question had been put to him casually, yet Jin Ho was taking it very seriously. He got up and pulled a scrapbook out of a cabinet. He opened it to reveal a vast collection of printouts and newspaper clippings. What's this? They were all articles about Jin Wu. The Red Gate incident, which the media still didn't know Jin Wu had been involved in, the Jeju Island raid, the traffic jam he cleared, and even his recent adventure with the Hunter's Guild in dealing with the stone statues. Jin Wu could only stare. You've been saving stuff like this? Yes, boss. Jin Ho blushed slightly. But why are you suddenly showing me these? Do you know what these articles have in common, boss? Well, the fact that they all related to Jin Wu was too obvious for that to be what his friend meant. Jin Ho responded as quietly as a mouse. I'm not in any of them, boss. If not for his heightened hearing, Jin Wu wouldn't have been able to make out his words. Huh? Jin Ho raised his head and met Jin Wu's eyes. Boss, if you go to Japan, please take me with you. Jin Wu was baffled. He figured Jin Ho would either try to stop him or encourage him, not ask to accompany him. But Jin Ho was dead serious. This is kind of embarrassing to admit, but you're my pride, boss. You're the only thing I have that I can boast about. But... Jin Wu snapped his mouth shut. On the outside, Jin Ho looked like he had it all. But money and material possessions were more of a burden to him, not things he could be proud of. But meeting Jin Wu and establishing the Ajin Guild was something Jin Ho had done himself. Jin Wu understood why he felt so strongly about it. That's why I'd like to be there with you, boss. Please take me along. You realize where I'm going, right? Jin Ho may have been somewhat naive and immature, but even he had to be aware of what was happening in Japan. It was hell on earth, where giants were deciding the fate of the country. Regardless, Jin Ho nodded resolutely. As long as you don't get hurt, I'll be fine. And if you do get hurt somehow, Gah! I don't even want to think about that. His big, bright eyes were full of the kind of unwavering trust that touched Jin Wu's heart. He playfully tousled the smaller man's hair. Jin Ho was bewildered but didn't resist. Be boss! I was only joking. 
Why would I go to Japan at a time like this? Jin Wu rose to his feet. Let's call it a day. Good work today. Huh? You're leaving already, boss? As Jin Wu waved goodbye, Jin Ho bowed deeply at the waist. I'll see you tomorrow, boss. Kerchak. Jin Wu entered his apartment. The smell of his mother's cooking reached his nose and made his mouth water. He took a moment to enjoy the aroma. So good. The best part of his mother being home again was having someone there to welcome him when he came through the door. Gone was the dark and lonely house from before. Is that you, son? Hyung Hai's voice came from the kitchen. Yes, mom. Jin Wu quickly took off his shoes and headed over to her. He greeted his mother with a smile. I'm home. You haven't eaten yet, right? No. How about Jaina? She said she doesn't have an appetite. Jin Wu stopped in the middle of pulling out a chair. Again? She couldn't sleep at all last night, so she just passed out now. Jin Wu noiselessly opened the door to Jaina's room. H. Nen. And Nen. His sister was restlessly tossing and turning in her sleep. Though she had maintained her bright personality, it seemed she was still suffering heavily from her trauma. Well, she has been through a lot. Every time he saw his sister anguishing, it made his blood boil and elicited an even deeper hatred of the magic beasts. What made them terrorize humans so relentlessly? Just then, he recalled the silver soldiers who had swept away the monsters. It had been an army of countless soldiers with a similar burning hatred. What if they really existed? Would they be our allies? The enemy of my enemy is my friend and all that. Ji Wu watched his sister a bit longer before closing the door. And later. Thanks for dinner, Mom. Jin Wu headed to the gym at the Hunters Association to work out after dinner. Posting a shadow soldier there proved convenient. At times like this, when his mind was a jumble of too many thoughts, exercising was the best way to clear his head. It had been a while since he'd properly worked up a sweat. He summoned Baru. As he did some light stretching, the former Ant King respectfully kneeled and bowed before him. My king! Baru was the only soldier in Jin Wu's shadow army who had any chance of withstanding his attacks. Yet, even he flinched, sensing that Jin Wu's power had grown. Congratulations, my king! I can feel that you have become much stronger! The incredible amount of magic power emanating from the Black Heart sent a chill down Baru's spine, and he was visibly trembling. However, Ji Wu hadn't summoned his soldier to show off his buff. He gestured for Baru to stand. Baru appeared puzzled by the worried look on Jin Wu's face, an expression he had never seen since joining the Shadow Army. Ji Wu spoke in a hushed tone. You need to attack me with everything you've got. My king, how could I dare? It's all right. I want to get a proper workout, and you're the only one who can do this. I... I am ever so great. Jin Wu leveled a suspicious glare at Baru as he made to kneel in a show of gratitude. Your vocabulary is improving. You didn't need a human somewhere, did you? Baru shrank back, so Jin Wu dropped it. He clenched his fists and repeated his order. Do your worst. It shall be as you command, your majesty. Baru raised his head and elongated his claws. Scraya! He unsheathed his talons fully, knowing they wouldn't harm Jin Wu anyway. The hunter grinned and gave a satisfied nod. Scree! With a loud roar that shook the whole gym, Baru jumped at him. Bam! Baru was slammed to the floor and splayed out on his back. Cree! 127 losses out of 127 fights. Baru had taken his best shot, but couldn't touch a hair on Jin Wu's head. In the few days since he'd seen Jin Wu, his master had grown much stronger. 
His respect for his king's power and loyalty toward him soared. Baru struggled to sit up as Jean Wu flopped down beside him. A few beads of sweat were visible on his master's forehead, but that was the best the ant could do. Any more, and the gym would have come crumbing down around them. Ji Wu sat on the floor in silence, staring into space. Baru carefully propped himself on his knees. My king, is something troubling you? Troubling me? Part of our minds are connected to yours, my king. Your distress causes us pain. Ji Wu couldn't believe he was being consoled by a shadow soldier. And not just any shadow soldier, but a former insect. He couldn't suppress a smile. Normally, he would brush off Baru's concern, but he couldn't this time. There's something I want to do, but I don't know how to go about it. What was happening in Japan wasn't his concern, nor did he know for certain what kind of danger awaited him there. Besides, he couldn't take on all the world's problems by himself. Then there were the complicated relations between the Hunters Association of Korea and the Hunters Association of Japan. Thinking about it all was giving him a headache. Baru's head snapped up. My king! Jean Wu was startled. This was the first time he'd heard Baru this emotional since transforming him into a shadow soldier. Nothing should stand in the king's way. Baru's voice was filled with conviction, and he sounded more like a longtime confidant than a magic beast turned shadow soldier. He who does whatever he wants. That is a true king. That's why I told you I'm not a king. The title Shadow Monarch was an arbitrary designation assigned to him by the system, after all. Baru strongly disagreed. With all due respect, you have enough power to do whatever you wish, my king. Jin Wu's eyes widened. Bottom. For some reason, his heart responded to Baru's words. You are a king without a doubt, Baru repeated. Strangely, Jin Wu was unable to calm his racing heart. Whatever I want to do. When he stared forward again, his eyes were as cold as steel. The next day, after the United States issued their statement, President Go also announced the Hunters Association of Korea's position regarding the situation in Japan. Korea will not be getting involved with the circumstances in Japan. Koshak, 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 Koshak. There was a flurry of flashing bulbs. President Go then proceeded to reveal in detail the Japanese hunters. Plans to thwart the Jeju Island raid. The evidence he presented was irrefutable including the surveillance camera recording of Shigeo Matsumoto, president of the Hunters Association of Japan, yelling at the top of his lungs at President Go and revealing his sinister schemes. The Japanese reporters, who had been holding out hope that Korea would come to Japan's aid, were utterly devastated. Their hands holding the cameras dropped limply to their sides. The Americans had already declined to help mere minth before and the ugly truth bomb dropped by the Koreans had been the final blow. Tears welled up in their eyes. That is all I have. President Go concluded his presentation. Normally, he would be flooded with questions at this point in a press conference, but every reporter in the room was rendered speechless by the shocking revelations. The stunned press room was broadcast live across the country as people finally realized why Korea had stayed silent about the tragedy unfolding within their neighbor's borders. However, President Go was about to leave the room, but then turned back. This is solely the decision of the Hunters Association. We will not stop any individual hunters from taking action. What did he mean by that? The reporters slowly stirred like animals waking from hibernation as they processed what President Go had just said. There is one such hunter who wishes to take on the giants. Whoever could that be? Who would want to go to Japan by himself under these circumstances? The room quickly became a frenzy, as even the teary-eyed Japanese reporters managed to re-raise their cameras. Please, please, 
hope blossomed in their hearts once more. One of the Korean reporters raised his hand high, and President Goh pointed to him. The reporter rushed to ask a question as if afraid of missing his shot. Just who is this hunter? All eyes were trained on President Goh. He waited a beat before leaning as close as he could to the mic. Hunter Jean Woosung. Koshak, 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 Koshak. Those three words were followed by an explosion of camera flashes.